Welcome for another Café Rollist. Today I am joined by Marx. Marx, could you briefly introduce yourself? I wear a lot of hats, as we discussed earlier. So, um, yeah, my name is Mark Shepard. I am your friendly local indie enthusiast. Um, mostly, I just shit post about indie. So that's that's my that's my uh, my shtick and um, yeah, my modus operandi at the moment. I am a podcaster, an interview podcaster for Yes Indeed Pod. I write and edit games, both freelance and for the San Gennaro Corp. And I am the very loosely applied chief editor of the indie zine, which is basically just an anarchic collective um, of like-minded indie enthusiasts. So yeah, lots of hats um, and yeah, but just kind of do a lot of TTRPG stuff and I'm very loud on Twitter. Well, that means we have a lot to, to talk about then. Uh, Quite a lot to unpack. Great. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know where to start. Uh, you you announced today on Twitter that uh, re you reminded people that yes, indeed, still existed. You you've been running into some yes. difficulties to to run uh, things uh, mm, on a really yeah. good basis. It's very tough. <laughs> Every two weeks is hard. Um, I don't tend to have much of a backlog, but yeah, yes, indeed, still exists. Uh, do, do you want to talk about yes, indeed? Yeah, sure. Unless you want yeah, to talk about it. something else first. No, let's let's do that. Podcasts are always fun. Um, yes, indeed, is a indie tabletop role playing game podcast, and we interview games and creators and notable players about their games and inspirations and about the theory, process, and practice of game design. There we go. I've managed to get my whole spiel across. Um, and it's we it's been going since January, and my my first guest was one of your friends, Federico Sones. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I've spoken to various people from the indie scene, both in the States and Australia, and sometimes in the UK as well. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I need to try to hook you up with some French designers. Uh, I'm trying to... That would be fun. ...to pull them uh, all way a, a tiny bit. We had a rather cool online convention recently. Of course, they don't all speak English or they don't have, and even when they do, most of them don't have their game in English, but some do, so so that could be some nice Yeah, that guests would be really fun. You. Yeah, absolutely. I love talking to people from all around the world. Um, we do a lot of interviews with people in South America as well, so we've had interviews with people in, lots of people in Argentina, a few people in Chile, uh, and yeah, basically I just, talk to whoever i think is interesting and some people i don't think are interesting as well so you started but, um, in, in january were you yeah already involved a lot in the uk gaming scene uh before then no not at all i i have a bigger sort of well not following but i, I sort of follow more people in america than i do in in britain uh it's i'm gradually building that up um it's it's a scene i'm finding it difficult to engage with to some extent because i'm so embedded in the american indie scene but you know i i really like the british viewpoint i had a fantastic conversation with my friend john garrett the other day and we discussed a lot about how british indie is really heavily influenced by warhammer 40k and by uh games workshop games oh, really? and that's yeah it's it's an interesting way to look at things but i think if you are in I think if you're in the States, you don't appreciate how much Games Workshop influences role playing games in the in the UK. It's a huge influence because that's lots of people's introduction to tabletop games. Um, like aside from board games that you play as a kid, that's a lot of what people do when they're younger. And I think that's really fascinating to kind of see the intersection between um, role-playing game groups and wargaming groups. Um, I think a lot of people are trying to move away from that now, but it's 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 a huge part of what the scene is. It's like it's where I started. I mean, I'm not interested in that scene anymore, but it's definitely where I began my role-playing game career. I think if you can call it that. So, yeah, it's um it's very interesting. Yeah, it's it's funny. I find my my view of 
the British scenes might be slightly distorted because I, I'm a listener of the, the Grognard files, which I find extremely interesting to to have a, a, one of the many point of views of, of the British scene. But uh, the, the Kuf, there are a couple takeouts for me from the Grognard files, which is a show I really recommend anyone to go check out. Uh, is that first, the UK sounds a bit like a, and it makes sense, an in-between between the US culture, which is heavily D&D influenced, like it's more than central, it's really overbearing, and it's been in the <laughs> days of TSR, and the French scene Certainly where it, it was slightly more balanced. So so listening to the Grognard file, it's interesting to see how Call of Cthulhu, RuneQuest, Warhammer 40k, mm-hmm. not, not yeah. 40k, but uh, uh, Warhammer Fantasy, yeah. And yeah, yeah. were important. And what I thought was fascinating about the British scene is that they, a lot of grognards, and I, I don't mean that in a pejorative term, it's for me, say, uh, that's a title a lot of friends uh, to take for themselves. So I, I don't think yeah. it's a negative. Uh, but for a lot of them in the British scene, it seems to be a very traumatic moment for the community. That moment when White Dwarf, which was the Games Workshop magazine, stopped supporting role-playing game to go full on with games workshop yeah, on, on Warhammer. absolutely and i've heard a lot about that <laughs> i don't <laughs> think i was around when that started but um yeah yeah that's a big mood i mean when i was when i was growing up i was um you know i was i was interested in that scene but the bit that i was interested in which i guess is kind of telling for what happened later it was the law and i i loved the warhammer 40k law i thought it was so deep and rich and clever and like Later, it turns out that it's all just parody on fascism, and that's pretty funny to me. So <laughs> it turns out that that was kind of a, a, I don't know, like an awakening of a socialist and an awakening of a role player rolled into one. So <laughs> it's, it's good. I mean, I, I love that scene. Um, and I, I think there's, it, it's really nice that there are places where people can go and play um, war games in a shop which is a kind of like a friendly environment and it's sort of a moderated environment and it's that's that's really good <laughs> and i kind of wish that there were more opportunities for role players to have that like i know places where that exist that that cater to that crowd but it's it's a very different feel and like that scene is that scene is really interesting to to look at from the outside <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting how I mean, when you hear from the US, the game shop seem the brick and mortar game shop seems to be an important place to play. While in Belgium mm. and France, those places tend to be very small, and you rarely f- ever play in there. Usually, you play in spaces which are which belong to to the the town. The, these are public spaces which are made available yeah. for association. And here in the UK, my experience, which was very uh, very special when I moved to London was you play in pubs. So on one hand, it's it's interesting you're exposed to to the wider public. Uh, it's not as private, even though you can have the the upper room. But on the other hand, there, there was also this aspect of uh, yeah, but kids cannot come then. You, so you don't have this mix of yeah. different generation like I I used to be. I wasn't in a role playing club in Belgium, but I was in a hobbyist club. And you really had that. You had the old man painting his World War II miniatures and I was doing my Star Wars things and he, he would teach me painting techniques and at the same time he would teach yeah. me about Sp- Spanish Civil War and stuff. Uh, here, clubs are really... It's for adults. Uh, I haven't heard of kids' clubs for, for role-playing here. No. I, it's it's a different way to approach the scene. And, like, I've been not not involved but I, w- I was a member of a role-playing group attached to a, a role-playing game and kind of comic book um shop here in leeds and that was really cool and it was really nice to go and meet people who were from your city um but i don't think that's that common an experience <laughs> so it's yeah, it's different. It's definitely different, I think, to what the American scene feels like at ground level. Um, I guess. I mean, I'm not really a part of that scene, but like secondhand, I guess that's 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 how it feels, you know. So 
I mean, that's what we your experience with, with like an enthusiast club. That sounds really fantastic. That's definitely the kind of thing I'd be really interested in attending, if only my language skills were sufficient. <laughs> it's uh, it's difficult to have a feel. I mean, my own show is sort of that that's central to to the Rollist podcast, not even Cafe Rollist, but the the main show to try to have a feel of what it's like to play in different countries. But it's very difficult because every no one you know to really compare two experiences you need to have had those two experiences so it's difficult when you run into a french or a britain or an american as so all different is your experience from the experience in the uk they don't know because they don't have the experience in the uk so what's yeah, your right. your yeah. ground for comparison yeah i mean my ground for comparison i guess is just that i speak to some people in america and I speak to some people in Britain, but like, at the moment, everything's weird anyway. So you know, nobody's playing in person. So, which has been interesting as well, because I think a lot more people have started playing online games this year. And um, certainly I've played in a few online games and organized a few, um, which has been really fun because I've not managed to do that for quite a long time. Um, primarily for the last few years, I've been engaging through play by post which is, you know, a whole subject in itself. Um, but yeah, the the actual live experience is way cooler. <laughs> I really like that. I just don't get a chance to do it very often. But you never had an opportunity to come to UK Games Expo or, or Dragon Meet before? I mean, I'm not like heavily embedded in the scene. I haven't been like really strongly involved for years and years and years. And um, no, I haven't. I haven't had that. I well, I haven't had the opportunity because then some of those cons haven't been running, um, and I haven't felt the need <laughs> to go. I would have gone to Aircon this year, which is our local convention, um, but it was wasn't on, and they didn't get organised enough to do it online. I mean, it was in April, so that's kind of very short notice. But hopefully, it'll be on next year, and hopefully, I'll be going next year. So you know, if anyone from the UK does want to go up to Harrogate in April, <laughs> they'll be able to meet me there and maybe have a podcast interview on that day. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe attending a couple of conventions next year. Yeah, well, actually, Fingers we, crossed. I believe we had John Dodd uh, on Cafe Release, and I believe he organizes Aircon on top of uh, his involvement with UK Games Expo and organizing Dragon Meet here in, in London. But uh, Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario, if April is too soon for for in person convention in the UK, despite the vaccine and so on, uh, I hope you'll join us in uh, in Dragon Meet in London. Uh, I'm sure we can make a spot for you at the the podcast zone here. Yeah, absolutely. I was listening to one of your podcast zone podcasts earlier. <laughs> it was really fun. It sounded great to uh, kind of just hook up and have a chat with people so I'd, yeah it's I'd really quite something to that. to sit down with with other podcasters and uh, and run into designers as well uh and you are a designer of games so uh i got some Perfect pictures segment. here so yeah. i'm gonna put them on <laughs> or oh, they're not starting from the start uh yeah it's missing one so a lot of noise in a quiet place was that your your first game it was the first game i published through through itch was it the first game um, I keep telling people that it was, but I guess, no, it wasn't. <laughs> but it's the first game that I wrote that I felt actually proud of, um, that I felt, you know, said something interesting and said something meaningful. Um, it's a game about my experiences of temporary hearing loss, which is kind of weird to say uh, out loud, but um, it's a it's a really interesting game. It's for two players and... The idea, although you know how well this works in practice, is that one of the players doesn't talk and the other player does that description. So it would be quite an intense experience, and I'm putting it through play testing at the moment to find out how it how it works out. But the intention is to bring it to Kickstarter for Zine Quest next year, which is why the cover looks the way it does because that's been done by me. Um, <laughs> I'm not an artist, not a graphic designer. Um, it looks good. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully all through Zine Quest, I'll be doing interviews with people uh, for Yes Indeed Pod as well every week rather than every two weeks, which is like super intense experience, um, but also a lot of fun. Uh, and yeah, I love Zine Quest. <laughs> I should just put that out there that it's it's my favorite Kickstarter thing. Um, I love 
the community that it generates and all the hype and the buzz and like everybody's doing a Kickstarter at once and it's really chaotic and manic and you don't know what's going on, but also loads of people are just creating projects and having a complete blast doing it. So yeah, yeah, I, I really like ZineQuest. So hopefully, yeah, my game will be up on ZineQuest next year and you can check it out. <laughs> So will that be your, the first time you participate? When you say you are a fan of the Inquest, you mean as a as a consumer of game or also as a designer? As a consumer, yeah, yeah, uh, and as a indie enthusiast, as an observer, um, I really love to watch how it everybody goes, you know, do lally and book, you know, backs loads of people's games and can get a handful of physical products for like no money at all, and you know, just have a great time doing it so yeah 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 I'm, i'm really looking forward to it so hopefully that'll be in february although actually it's not been announced by kickstarter yet so i hope they haven't decided to just knock it on the head because that'd be a lot of people's 2021 publication plans down the pan <laughs> so uh how does someone uh not totally involved in the indie scene in the UK gets involved with the indie scene in uh, in California, in the US, uh, with San Gennaro Co-op? Uh, or did that happen? And what is it, So for people who are not aware? <laughs> That's an interesting story. It kind of ties back to the play-by-post thing. So I used to play with this, um, with this really cool person on Twitter, uh, Pep Overdrive. And we used to play a lot of play-by-post together. We were in, like, many simultaneous campaigns you know um i don't know how much about play by post you know but like typically people play in three or four campaigns because at the, any one moment one of them might just drop dead which is very interesting oh sorry one second i've Did just seen a peregrine falcon land in my garden wow <laughs> that was really cool <laughs> oh, i'm looking sorry. over london there's no pilgrim in my oh, it, it, <laughs> they'd be very quick to fly over there in time um Yeah, so Pep Overdrive uh, is a really cool person who you should follow. Um, and basically, one day I just was kind of fed up with the way that, like, I was writing a couple of short games here and there and publishing them on Drive Through RPG and Itchio, and you know they weren't getting any attention. I was like, well, what if we all like made a bundle together and put our voices together and, um, you know, try to make something that lots of people would buy. And Pep Overdrive we retweeted this for me. And they've got a pretty big following. And it got picked up by loads of people. And it just kind of went mini viral, I guess is the word. Um, and somebody from, uh, I don't know if you know of Sandy Pug Games, but Nem from Sandy Pug Games messaged me and said, hey, I'm part of this co-op. Would you like to join? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So then I was hooked up to this global collective of people who produce a quarterly games digest and i've been involved pretty heavily ever since i you know i'm one of the creative lead is a strong word but i do project lead for a lot of their projects now and step in when people uh, get too busy and stuff so yeah it's it's really fun and the small games digest short games digest whatever it is we call it is um is really fun And it's an opportunity for people to get their work published um, and work with experienced graphic designers and really talented artists and um, get involved with the editing process, which um, is an experience for people who, <laughs> for, for new writers, it's like, it's a real experience working with an editor and it's like really revealing and tells you a lot about your own work as well as about how stuff needs to sound when it, when it's going out into the world. So Yeah, that's um, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, as I said, we put out a quarterly games digest, but we also do a few other projects as well. So we've been involved with uh, Kickstarter last year for the Role Players Guide to Heists, which has just come out in in full, and um, that's a really fun book. I wasn't involved with it unfortunately because it was before I arrived at the co-op, but it's really good. Uh, it's a collection of 20 plus heists, system agnostic for, you know, you can just plug into your campaign whenever you feel like robbing a bank or whatever weird ideas they have. So, um, yeah, that's a really good book. And um, 
it's something that the corp is really really proud of so yeah you should check it out <laughs> well yeah people should i will include the link uh in the description of the episode so people can find it easily so editing is it something you you do as part of your work and you extended that to roleplaying him or did you start doing this type of work um, or <laughs> why working on on this project i have well okay i'm um i work in built environment i'm an I, i'm a failed engineer <laughs> i i don't really work as an engineer anymore i work as a, a modeler um, but i review a lot of technical documents and like a role-playing game is pretty much just a technical manual i'm There's built like environment map. as well <laughs> yeah yeah that's, a, that's um, why i've got a, an eye for graphic design i'm not the best at it but i can recognize good graphic design work from working on reports and so on exactly yeah and um so that what that like, kind of gives me is is a sort of insight into what good clear concise documentation looks like i think that's really really important for role-playing games especially the instructions part of it um the other side is the kind of the fluff text the flavor text that goes with it and like i've always been a pretty keen creative writer uh but not really had that much of an outlook for it so i think those two kind of things have combined to make the perfect storm for me to <laughs> get involved with editing and proofreading so you know I, i really enjoy it and um it's it's really interesting to learn about how different people write and how different people's styles work and like the work of an editor is not to change that but to bring it out and that's really important uh, and it's a, it's a really important consideration for for how writers need to sorry that's re it's really important for writers to work well with an editor um and you know i think that's been the biggest lesson for me uh, as being part of the co-op that the relationship between writer and editor is the best thing to make a role playing game really shine you, you so. had a very good episode about that uh, on in, uh, yes indeed uh, my favorite one so far was with francita brent i yeah. think and a third francita person. brent and uh somebody whose name i've forgotten uh hackliff is the only name i can remember um <laughs> yeah and brent is a very talented and very experienced editor in the role playing game space and he's worked on a huge number of projects from both really really big projects to tiny projects like they do for the rpg capitalist project catalyst did i say capitalist that's a blunder is it capital um, the rpg or... catalyst project which Cap is a sort of accelerator for small games and um yeah brent spoke really eloquently and concisely about the importance of editing um next year I'm, i there'll be an episode of yes indeed that i recorded the other day with john garrett proper gothic on twitter who is also an editor um and we we talked a lot <laughs> about how important editing is and like it's it's really strange like it's you very quickly build up a relationship between writer and editor because there's trust involved on both parts um you need to trust your editor and your editor needs to know that you're going to give them something that they can actually work with so it's yeah i think that's really interesting and i think it's something that um first time publishers or first time game writers don't necessarily have an appreciation for because you've never been involved with the writing process before but you know just understanding what different kinds of editing look like and what different you know just basic things like that i think that's really important um and it's really useful to have access to that as a member of the corp so yeah it's pretty thrilling i think i think it's critical that, i mean uh, i was discussing not, not too long ago on twitter with a, a french speaker and and uh, they were asking me about my project and i uh, and i was saying well i'm about to I'm, I'm about to probably hire an editor and then we'll be graphic designer and then artist or not exactly in that order but necessarily but uh And and they were like, "What's an editor? What's a graphic designer?" And I was like, "No, right, <laughs> you yeah, published yeah. three games. Uh, it's uh, of course you, you can have a different. Uh, or you say that in English, démarche. You know, you, you can have uh, an approach which is which is different. But 
it's I, I think if you want something really which comes across very strongly to whoever reads it it's it's really critical to have that but at the same time i recognize also it's especially in france and I, I see some parts of the hobby which are a bit more like that uh in the, the english speaking world where the i guess the they're a bit more auteur ish which is which is not even quite accurate the, the, this image in the media of the author of the artist as someone who is a loner who do everything on their own and and even the people who thought they, they did not start it but popularized the term author like french nouvelle vague cinema they still work mm. in a team they didn't make movies on their own holding the camera themselves no. writing the script no, and the music right. on their own so sometimes it's missing yeah. this idea of teamwork i think it's a bit more prevalent in the english-speaking world it's more a craft yeah. than an, an artist thing uh. i think it's it's interesting because all of these things are completely essential to getting your game out there and to getting your game seen but editing is is different again because that's something that gets you repeat business <laughs> if you have a poorly edited book it only shows when somebody reads it um if you have a, a book that doesn't have good art, it probably just won't sell in the first place. Um, and all of these things kind of tie in together and they all feed back on each other. But, you know, I think that that's a lot of what it's about. So like it's the other place that I was going with that because <laughs> I'm all over the place, but I, I think this is a really interesting subject um, is that I think itch.io is a really good uh, experimentation space. And I think that's a really important space for people to be able to write stuff by themselves and do kind of rudimentary book layout in uh google docs or whatever and then export it to pdf or in microsoft word or you know any any one of these basic pieces of software for book layout they're not basic but you know what i mean and um and you know maybe proofread it themselves but it's really hard to proofread your own stuff like you can't actually do that um and you know get illustrations from you know stock photography or stock vector art and that kind of thing and that space is really really vital and really important and so i do think there is a place in the world for the rpg auteur auteur so you know i think that's I think it's so important that that exists but equally if you want to sell stuff on drive for rpg or on dms guild and get loads and loads of money then you do need to work with a team um as a kind of apocryphal story from myself about how this works i published i think three games through drive for rpg and itch.io last year and i made basically no money on drive for rpg at all like I don't get any sales on that, even though technically that is better for um, getting an exposure to the market. But on itch.io, I publish stuff on there and I get enormous tips. Like the, it's it's wild. Like even though there is basically no, it there is not a good um, marketplace feel on itch.io. You kind of just have to follow the right people. Um, it's it's wild, like completely wild how that space works and how people are just willing to try stuff out from complete unknowns. So I, I think it's so important to have that, that space, especially for indie, like the mainstream, they, they've got these big fancy platforms that you can do whatever you want with. Um, and even like big indie has these fancy platforms as well, but yeah, being able to self publish through itch.io is, is basically the only reason that I, think it's worthwhile for me <laughs> to keep working in that space um so yeah i think it's 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 there's a, there's a space for both teams and for a a sole practitioner as it were and i think for some things that doesn't apply so if you're writing a game that has maybe controversial or sensitive content i think 100 percent you need to work with other people and you need to ask them is this okay to publish which is kind of what my kickstarter next year is is all about i want to get funds to pay people to check that my work is not harmful um but if you are just writing a fantasy role-playing game hack that 
you're not particularly, you know, it doesn't, doesn't feel particularly awful, then yeah, you need that space. You need that space to practice and, and to try things out and to build up a following. So yeah, there's definitely lots of reasons to, to, to bat for both sides, I think. Yeah, I mean, the complementary, the often things are presented like they are in direct competition and one's going to win over the other. Uh, I think they are there to coexist and provide a different service to a different audience and different things. Although I was reading recently on Twitter that people were looking at the, the top sales in tabletop role-playing games on Itch.io and they were saying, oh, much things changed. The things were already much more professional looking than than they used to be when you looked at the top sales than they, they might have been a, a year or two uh, ago yeah yeah absolutely i think that's definitely true that space has um evolved just while i've been using it as well and there are some really big names on there um so like evil hat moved all of their well they didn't move it but they they have all their stuff on itch.io now and other other big names are doing that as well like um Machine Age, uh, that's Olivia Hill's production company. They they are now entirely on Itch.io. I think you you obviously you can still get it on Drive Through, but that's the space that they kind of direct you towards. Um, and I think that's so valid, you know, that that big names are willing to say, you know, actually we'd like to move away from that mainstream platform if we could. Um, so let's open up this new platform, this new road for people to to work with us. And it kind of there's a sort of social element to it as well like that it has following and follow back and that sort of thing and you know there's discussion forums which are a bit quiet i think at the moment and there's loads of different tools and it's just it's a it's a really fantastic <laughs> marketplace so i i'm i'm really enthusiastic about where itch.io is headed and if they had a couple of extra features it would be completely perfect for me and i would be able to move away from drive for rpg completely <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, can you tell us about that next project you briefly mentioned? Uh, is it uh, public already? You mentioned a project you're working on for which you you want Kickstarter so you can pay for sensitivity readers. And that's like. a loud noise in a quiet place. Okay, that's yeah. the one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, it's it's because it's a game about temporary hearing loss. I want to get a lot of insight from people who are. Um, lowercase or uppercase deaf um, or hard of hearing because it, there are lots of things which could come up even though it's a very short text in the game which could be offensive or you know uh, in in some way you know not very sensitive to those communities and whilst I am really really explicit in that game to say this is not about permanent deafness this is not about permanent hearing loss I really want to make sure, and I like this is the thing that I'm most anxious about when I write RPGs that what I write is not harmful. Um, so yeah, I I just want to be able to pay people to <laughs> to make sure that my work is okay. Uh, and if I get a lot of money on that campaign, then I'll be able to pay people to do other really professional and important um, roles in that, such as book layout and such as um, illustration. And I have a group of people who I think are really excited about this project who I would really, really like to give money to. So please come back in February and back my back my campaign because it would mean a lot to me. What I've seen also with uh, indie publishers and Kickstarter, uh, you, you mentioned Federico Sons with uh, Nibiru. Sometimes the Kickstarter is also there to have a, a print run of a number of physical copies to, to put in stores or bring to conventions. Yeah. Is it something you'd like to do as well? That's that's a huge part of it as well. Yeah, if um, I have a really really cool print shop in Leeds, uh, I'm sorry, I say I have. Um, I know of a really cool print shop in Leeds who are zine printing specialists. Oh wow! And they have really cool equipment. <laughs> quite, quite appropriate. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so they have uh, loads of really cool equipment, and their runners are cooperative. And whenever I spoke to them, they seem like very cool people. And I just imagine them, I've not actually been to their workshop, but I just imagine them as like, you know, typical Mohican punks um, working on risograph printing machines. Uh, I don't know if that's an, a, in any way an accurate representation of what their workshop is like, but um, I'm really, really excited to be able to commission them to print a zine. 
um and hopefully the one that i'm involved with is is where that's going to go um yeah so i would really like to have it in print I, I i want one to put on my shelf but i want other people to be able to hold it in their hands and say yeah this is this is a cool game that mark's made so that would be nice <laughs> so and where does a cardigan lane fits in in that <laughs> uh cardigan lane is my... of it on the side <laughs> Cardigan Lane is a short game. So it's going in the San Gennaro Court Short Games Digest. Um, and it will be out tomorrow, hopefully. Oh, so uh, December 15th, then. December 15th. If, um, if our layout designer and um, drive-through RPG guru <laughs> can get everything stitched together and uploaded in time then it, the pdf version of the san gennaro corp short games digest volume 7 fall 2020 winter 2020 sorry uh, will be out tomorrow and that features my game cardigan lane and this is a game about british soap operas um it's a it's a tribute to british soap operas and it is well for me it's actually quite a long game but it's about 10,000 words um, and it's uh, if you've got the pictures there in front of you they're drawn mostly by my friend um, Nymphael on Twitter who is a really really talented artist from Argentina and um, you can see that they're they're like playing cards yeah, and this is a game that's played with cards and you describe scenes that look like a soap opera and yeah it's fun i think it's a really fun game uh i think it's quite it's supposed to be entertaining <laughs> and it's supposed to be melodramatic and completely over the top but i think it's something that um i don't know like uh, the other game that people talk about the soap operas is passion de las pasiones which um, is very which good is powered by the apocalypse <laughs> game which yeah is really really good but it, it's a different genre <laughs> That's a telenovela, and um, I very briefly, uh, well, I, I was on a study trip in South America, in Ecuador, about 10 years ago, and I watched quite a lot of telenovelas, um, and it's completely different to what a British soap opera looks like. <laughs> but so when you say British and soap opera, them. because I'm, not, I'm yeah. not the most aware of, uh, let's call it mainstream British television, I'm... I'm much more of That's aware good. of oh, yeah. yeah every time I got my in-laws come here we have to put on the the BBC news and and just that really ooh, makes me feel really really bad uh sorry for people who work uh, at BBC uh <laughs> but uh British soap opera is that EastEnders is it the only way is Essex is it something else <laughs> older it's it's EastEnders, it's Coronation Street, it's um, Casualty and Hollyoaks and the Archers on the radio and all of these things. And um, when I was growing up, um, my family liked these things a lot, but they all liked different ones. So I just, I have a lot of exposure to this. <laughs> uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that was an expert. I don't go out every week and buy soap opera magazines, but I do still watch quite a lot of these because I just think they're really entertaining. And they tell stories that are um they 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 tell interesting stories and they tell things that um you know some people don't have a lot of experience of in their day-to-day -day life and maybe don't think about a lot so there's a lot of there's a lot of like just generally really awful stuff and all the characters have dreadful lives and like you know they seem to get over things very quickly so that they can move on to the next dreadful storyline and it's like, I don't know. It's really hard to describe what a British soap opera is like to somebody who's not, <laughs> so who hasn't seen one. But um, I don't know. It's it's very specifically not the only way is Essex because I have no experience of that show. But also, I think that is kind of a bit more. What do they call it? They call it um, structured narrative, <laughs> which is like kind of kind of. Do, not that not that interesting to me i i'm more interested in the the fiction and the the drama and the melodrama 
of these ridiculous plots. So yeah, it's interesting um, because uh, now no that you talk about it, I'm trying to, to come, you know, convey in my mind the images from it. Uh, I might be entirely wrong, but it f also feels like that those shows tend to be quite middle, lower mi middle class. While if you look at shows which are it's got a bigger budget and you know uh, quotation marks somewhat more respectable uh, things, they always tend to to immediately go with people who have a standing in life which is much higher mm -hmm. than the type the of characters you see on, on those shows. It's uh, you know it's something I always lament about mm. a lot of shows that they got big apartments. They're like, oh, I've got money issues and so on, but they yeah. always live in big apartments. Yeah. They got big jobs. Even Fleabag, she's struggling financially, but everyone seems to be loaded around her. And and yeah. then and then yeah, there, there are very little shows in which you see people who are who seems to have a a level of life which is similar to to my yeah. own, or I, think, I would say most people. I think this is another part of why I wanted to write the story because a lot of um, a lot of British soap operas are, as you say, they're they're quite working class stories. Um, EastEnders is like explicitly working class. That nobody in that job has nobody in that um, program has a job that is kind of better paid than um, I think I think a, a sort of beat police officer is maybe the kind of pinnacle job that, that the people in that program have. Um, and there are some wealthy people in it, but they're kind of they're kind of uh, wheeler dealers. You know, they're they're sort of the uh, Rodney and Delboy types. Um, and I think the so so for the San Gennaro Court, that's perfect because we are a collective of leftists and we think working class stories are really important and are missed out a lot. Um I I think I sort of want to countenance what you say by um saying that British TV programs I think often have this working class outlook because we support an underdog. <laughs> that's part of British culture. Um but certainly soap operas. So the ones that I listed there, um, one of them is a hospital drama. Casualty is a hospital drama. So everyone on that is very poor and they're constantly complaining about how the NHS is in a poor situation. And like, it's, uh, so that's an interesting story. That's a really interesting story. And it's kind of a working class story as well. Um, the Archers is about rural life. And there are a lot of working class stories there. There are also a lot of farming stories, which people don't hear about. I, I think that's really interesting. <laughs> um, and like Coronation Street, there is a factory in that where all of the workers hate the owners. Like that's cool. <laughs> uh, and like, there's, so there's all these sorts of working class stories. And I think the co-op is really down with having having those told. Um, and like, you don't have to play a working class character, but I think they have more interesting stories than the middle class characters. Um, but that's just my opinion, really. <laughs> but it's fascinating Maybe. because then Go if you contrast try. that, because when I grew up, uh, the soap operas I was exposed to were American soap operas because they, they were, that's what they would show in the middle of the day. So either when I was sick, that's the only thing which was on TV, or that would be what my mother was watching. So it was the, the young and the restless, to a lesser extent, Dynasty, Dallas. But all those shows yeah. center around people who own a cosmetic company or in Dallas who are petrochemicals millionaires. And suddenly yeah, like the, yeah. the, an architect shows up and he's like, Oh, the, the girl from, from the family is going to hook up with the architect who, who is an actual person who works. And, <laughs> and it's interesting to see how American shows tend to focus on these. Of course, there are some notorious yeah. examples like, I guess, Roseanne, uh, and in, we know where it went uh, in terms of the cast, but uh, yeah, it's interesting to see this how different uh, it seems that British programs are uh, with that. Yeah, I wonder if it's a sort of thing that kind of a country's soap operas or a culture's soap operas kind of have a really strong influence on on like or not strong influence, but are really strongly influenced by what the national psyche is like. If you can kind of use that word, like. I think I sort of touched on it there when I said that British people or British culture is a lot about supporting the underdog and having a, having a go at authority. Um, and I wonder then if 
the media culture in America wants to portray this idea of ri richness and grandeur, which I don't think would fly quite so well <laughs> in Britain. That, that said, you know, um, what's it called? Made in Chelsea is extremely popular, apparently, for some completely unknown reason. I, I, I can't fathom that program at all. They all talk too quickly. <laughs> It's like the, a British I, version of Gilmore Girls. I really hate it. <laughs> oh, that's that's really unkind to Gilmore Girls. I find. It is, yes, I know, <laughs> but uh, it's also because I partly dislike Gilmore Girls. But Gilmore Girls, it, you know, it's interesting because you think Gilmore Girls, Friends, or I Met Your Mother. Again, the architect within that often is the poorest. Why it's it's already a well earning uh, job, but you know it's. I was reading, yeah, I don't know, you know, there's a lot of big, big issues uh, here in, in the United Kingdom. And and it's interesting how it, it seems to be split. It, it seems like those things sounds like typical British. At the same time, it feels like there's a big push from a lot of production, BBC, Netflix, and so on. You see shows like The Crown, where it it's not... It's looked down upon, you know, so prayers like that and the, the teams they, they are discussing, they, they're not just looked down upon in terms of topics, but even, uh, no, I mean, the opposite. They're not just looked down upon in terms of production, but even the, the type of characters and stories they tell seems to be pushed out of more important productions, uh, mm. with the exception maybe of yeah. cinema. People would be like, oh, yeah, that's more... That's more boring stuff for a Ken Loach movie. It's too serious for TV. We want people want glitter and glamour and to be taken uh, taken away. So it, it it sounds a bit. I I I'm exaggerating a bit, making this this parallel. But it sounds like sort of the two Englands, you know, being split. The metropolitan England was into fee, flea bag, and the outside London uh, people would be more into uh, traditional shows like uh, Coronation Street and and so on. Sure. I mean. I think part of that is it's interesting that you mentioned that because like these shows are about local areas they are about small communities that are not metropolitan like i know east enders is set in london but it's not set in central london yeah no it doesn't it's feel like that at all yeah westminster yeah um coronation street is set in manchester and was kind of like famously set in manchester you know this is at a time when this was at a time when um television was very centralized and there were not a lot of regional accents and then suddenly you've got this program where everyone has a really really strong manchester accent and that's fantastic um uh i i think the the major the the ones that are different here are things like um hollyoaks which is set in chester and it's set around a university and like that's and so everyone there has kind of more metropolitan outlook if you like but even that it doesn't feel like a centralized production it feels like something that is very close to its community so it's it's really it's 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 it's, it's really different to kind of look at these things um through the lens of metropolitan versus non-metropolitan areas um which is a big which is a big deal in britain actually it is it's a huge deal one second while i tell my boss to go away there we go <laughs> perfect what does it mean do not disturb come on um so yeah it's it's a, it's a big mood i think the co-op are very much down with telling game with telling stories and and writing games that are about things other than the metropolitan elite if you like uh, and and the corp especially has been you know we've got a bit of a drive recently to move away from games that are about killing things and taking their money um and I think telling stories about working class people who don't fight and murder each other all the time is is kind of is kind of a part of that movement away. So maybe I'm being a bit lofty about that, but I think it's really important to to look at these stories to have fun telling them. Um, I don't know. You mentioned Ken Loach there as well. <laughs> I think Ken Loach is to is to cinema what soap operas are to television. Um, so. 
maybe there's something in that. Well, yeah, and people Who should knows? go check Land and Freedom from Ken Loach, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, movies. Uh, Gosh, but... yes, that's a fantastic film. Uh, so where was I going with that? Uh, so no, no, I think I think it's entirely worthwhile to do stuff which are not killing monsters and and gathering gold. I think it's. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm beating a dead horse in each episode, bringing up Dungeons and Dragons, but uh, I really don't agree with this idea that D and D going well is good for the hobby as a whole. I think it's hiding or different and mm. or open. It could be two different genres. Today I was a, I saw a, a tweet uh, again French RPG, and they were discussing. Hang on a minute, are there any sports-based tabletop role-playing games? And you know, soap opera sports are things which are immensely popular. They are way more popular even today when we say, oh yeah, so so much uh, Marvel, Tolkien, all of that is on the big screen. Yeah, sports and soap opera are still way more popular than, than this stuff. So if, if there were games about that, and they are, but if those games were a bit better known, there might be a whole audience out there who is absolutely not interested into dragons and orcs and so on, but would be very interested into playing uh, members of a football team or playing uh, yeah. the, the cast of Coronation Street uh, and so on. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Goalposts and Gridirons comes to mind, which is a, a lasers and feelings hack, I think, um, where you play with American football teams. But... <laughs> That's kind of a, that's kind of an aside. Oh, for I, I think American friends, right. I meant soccer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big mood. Um, I think you're right. Um, I, I, a lot of what I want to do when I write games is to be able to write something that's accessible for people who've never played a role-playing game before. And I think a lot of indie people maybe don't do that. Um, like, I don't want to get on my hobby horse about this, but games like Lasers and Feelings, which I've sort of just mentioned, um, have uh, they have they look really easy and simple to play because it's one page. You don't have to read six hundred pages to understand how to play. But you do have to have played a role playing game before, I think, to be able to play it well. Um, I think there's so much implied in indie, um, and some games are better about this than others. I think that's fine. Like I don't mind. Yeah, at no, all. no. Um, but I want to be able to write a game that somebody could just pick up, look at, and think that sounds cool. And having never played a game before, go away and be able to work out how to play that and find some other people and teach them. Um, and like absolute double bonus if these people had also never heard of Dungeons and Dragons, that would be amazing, but uh, unlikely at this juncture. Um, so I think that's a big part of what I think is important in writing games. Um, and I think making them simple in that regard, you know, not having hundreds of things to keep track of is, is an important part of it. But there's other important parts as well, such as writing things that are interesting to everybody and aren't just interesting to people who like fantasy and science fiction. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with, with game design at the moment. And you you got a good point about the indie games though. There's so much which is implied, and you know there's a fine balance. And sometimes we I think we forgot that even stuff which comes across as crunchy, of course they're complicated. They take a time to learn and maybe a game master to to have system mastery to run the game, but actually they offer a robust framework for people who are not. You know, they don't have the, they don't get the innuendo of lasers and feelings, but they, they really welcome a, a set of rules which helps them say, okay, this is what you can, cannot do, what you're supposed to do, and they, they, get, they get on uh, with it. So I think that's part of the appeal of Dungeons and Dragons with a, a lot of players, even yeah. if it's sadly narrow to, to the genre of, of dungeon crawling. Uh, I, th yeah. I think simpler yeah, is not ne necessarily better for people who are not natural people who are improvising or people who actually played other complicated games and now get, okay, this is not stated, but actually this is how it works. Yeah, I think you're right. Like, there's, there's two sides to that. 
um it is it is a double-edged knife <laughs> if you if you make something too simple it does make it it does make it make you lean more heavily on improvisation and on understanding how understanding how to do storytelling and narrative i think if you make something too complicated you put people off so yeah striking that balance is is interesting so cardigan lane is probably the crunchiest game i ever i've ever written <laughs> because it involves cards and i got carried away um because there's so much you can do with cards and i love i love playing cards as a mechanic everyone's um, doing cards at the moment <laughs> we're all doing cards I just i'm designing cards. my first game it has cards <laughs> I love playing cards um, they because they have memory um, and dice don't have memory. Um, one of my friends is writing something where you, you roll uh, a handful of dice at the start of the game and you keep those dice and you play them when you want to. I'm like, what? why? You know, <laughs> you could just you could just use playing cards. <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, uh, and they're so interesting because they have four different suits, two different colors. They have kind of an implied meaning. They have face cards, which are always interesting. Um, and you can just do so many things with them that you can't do with dice. <laughs> and I love dice. I like rolling dice. But I also, I think playing cards and tarot cards are really cool. So um, I, shouldn't get, I shouldn't get onto my uh, discussion about how tarot is the most cool thing. And uh, I want to design <laughs> a game with tarot, but not even the, not the Marseille tarot, the other tarot. What is it called? With the, you got the sticks, the cups, the coins, and uh, the blades. Um, uh, it's Italian tarot, I think. Well, it's it's Mediterranean thing. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know which one you mean. There's um, well, there's like four different, yes. three or four different major tarot, and then there's four. loads of like weird ones as well. Um, I also like German suited decks. They're really interesting. Uh, and the PK deck, which is ace through six and then jack queen king <laughs> which is really weird um and th that one's cool because it has very few cards i usually play a pk deck with um two sets anyway you know it's uh, there's there's a lot we've there's got sardonicus in the chat room who says rider weight I, I i'm not sure what it applies to right right away is kind of um is the alistair crowley uh Ooh. tarot deck so that's oh uh, no sorry that's the thoth deck um so you've got my my friend in Fael, who I mentioned earlier, wrote a really really succinct summary to what um, to the to the three or four different tarot types that there were in the last short games digest. So if you want a short and succinct <laughs> breakdown of those, then yeah, you know where to find it. It's in Short Sorry. Games Digest six. So uh, my next guest is uh, will be uh, the team of uh, Mach Machine Age actually. Uh, I expect we. we oh really? Talk, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, on on Monday, uh, a bit later, not our regular time. I think it will be half past four p.m. here in uh, in the the UK, uh, since they are in Pacific time, and unlike previous guests, they were not willing to wake up at six in the morning. Uh, but no. uh, <laughs> any chance you you would work on a localization of High Hunt uh, in uh, Great Britain working class? Uh, Olivia Hill is a member of the co-op, and I have spoken to Olivia in the past about doing this. But oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not my story. Um, I I love I Hunt. I really I do dearly love I Hunt, and I have um, I have a huge amount of respect for Olivia and um, and Olivia's team. I I absolutely love that game. It is not a game that I will be able to write for, <laughs> uh, effectively, because it's not. It's not a. Um, it's not a genre that interests me to write about. I love reading about it, and I I would love dearly to be able to play it. I hunt again, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm not. Um, I don't think it's my story. Basically, I'm not. A, oh, it's fine. I mean... I'm not a gig economy worker. Um, and I would like to leave the opportunity for somebody with with better experiences to tell. Um, but I think there are so many interesting things you could do with British folklore. Um, and like some cities in Britain lend themselves so well to this, like York <laughs> is haunted. <laughs> um, haunted so much that my uncle runs a shop in York that uh, is a ghost shop. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. <laughs> which sells ghosts. Yeah, it's weird. Um, uh, and like other, other cities have this really deep connection to Roman history and to uh, Celtic tradition. I think Wales has all of these amazing folk stories. I think Scotland has all of these different kind of um, traditional, weird, mythical creatures that you don't get in other countries. And I think there are so many cool stories to tell. And I feel like as a, uh, as, a as someone from the Midlands, <laughs> I don't necessarily have these stories to tell. <laughs> Because so my because, cities are all like brand new. <laughs> uh, they, they were asking for for inspiration for a, a supplement about boomers, and uh, I was yeah. bringing up and I thought it, it would be quite interesting to to do a an image of that in the High Hunt was the the clash between the traditional black cabs drivers here in London who have to be trained, they have to have the what's called the knowledge. So the, yeah. before GPS, they were supposed to to know by heart the map of London, their way around London, and a bunch of facts. It's a, it's a complete test they, they need to pass. And so they, there's this very strong tradition. They, they got some sort of lobby slash union. And when Huber moved in here in London, it was so disruptive. And... And it's interesting to see the two sides because uh, not taking the side of Uber itself, but the, the workers of Uber, uh, it was interesting to see their, well, I guess for lack of a better word, millennial point of view on things, which was black cab drivers tend to be all middle-aged white men. And they were kind of a, yes, yeah, so I think it's fair to say a somewhat racist uh, organization and environment and Uber offered an opportunity to do something else while at the same time being exploited by a huge corporation. Mm. And the, the clash between the two was very interesting. And I was like, that would be so cool to see that with, with yeah, Monster that's Hunters. Really if, so you got High Hunt coming to London and in London you would have an old established organization like I guess the Watchers <laughs> in Buffy who are middle class yeah. work, work yeah. Uh, working class and they've been fighting monsters since i don't know the arthurian, uh, arthurian times and whatnot and now they got this cool kid showing up with an app it's like what <laughs> what do you think you're doing that's and so interesting yeah that's really interesting and like um there's other stories that you can tell around that as well um like here in west yorkshire we have like there aren't that many black cabs we mostly just catch mini cabs um and like when Uber came in, all of the minicab and black cab drivers got together and they started protesting this by just driving really, really slowly around Bradford Town Hall, which is a completely fascinating story. Um, and, and now, of course, like nobody is doing any cab journeys at all. And it's it's kind of sad. And um, I don't know. I think there's, there's so many interesting stories that you can tell um, about uh, the intersectionality of working class and um, racism and race politics in Britain, which is different to race politics in America for like a wild variety of reasons. And I think that some of that nuance gets lost. I, I'm obviously not the best person to talk about <laughs> race politics in, in Britain, but I, I'm like, I'm fascinated by those stories. Like, um, the the current series on BBC Small Axe I think is is doing a huge amount of really important work in that in that regard. Um, I think people just need to. Well, no, I don't think people need to do anything. I think it's just very interesting to look at these stories and to integrate them into into role playing games as well. So, oh no, no, yeah, <laughs> no, you bring that up. Uh, I, I'd really like. I mean, I I, I don't have. Uh... I'm not part of that, so I don't have I have zero knowledge. But I would be very curious to to have someone uh, a, a, a black individuals write a story, fire hunt or something else, but inspired by the the wind rush uh, immigration here. Mm. I think that that, that would be an amazing story really cool. to to learn real stories be, yeah. to learn, and at the same time, uh, yeah, cr fictional stories uh, uh, to to be created because they they would have their whole fun folklore and uh, the situation uh, arriving here that would be quite exciting but 
this is not a show where we create uh, games, especially games which relate to communities we are not <laughs> directly part of. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> uh, but uh, we passed the one hour mark. Uh, is there was there something else we forgot to to discuss about you? You wanted to to bring up? No, not really. Um, all of those things are happening, hopefully. Uh, so that there, there's. Short Games Digest out tomorrow. A Loud Noises in a Quiet Place is out. Well, we'll be in Kickstarter in February. Kickstarter permitting. And uh, yes, indeed, Pod will be back when I can get around to editing the two and a half hours of footage that I have that's unedited at the moment. Um, maybe next week when I'm off work. Fingers crossed. Who knows? Editing takes time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, ever. I'm so fed up of it <laughs> and you know we 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 are fools because <laughs> i was listening you know uh, i know you listen to a lot of podcasts recently i was listening to panda's talking game and they released a couple of episodes which were pretty much unedited and and they realized they were as popular because except you me and the people who edit the show <laughs> nobody actually cares so i'm spending a lot of time editing things uh, not Café Rollies, but the other shows. And uh, yeah, I don't think people care that much. So uh, we should, uh, maybe we should I do a bit less do. of that. I don't think they do Well, actually, things. I got a review on Reddit, which said, um, which said, Yes Indeed Pod is really good. But if you, if you, oh, I'm sorry, there's someone at my front door. One second. Go ahead. I guess I should talk on my own to keep things going. Uh, I guess I would remind people, please, please. Sorry, uh, sorry, postman. That's fine. I was trying to, <laughs> I was about to, to make a commercial break and uh, instruct people to <laughs> follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, subscribe here on YouTube, uh, leave a comment. These are very important. Leave a like. Uh, those are very encouraging uh, and go do that with uh, yes indeed as well uh, go subscribe it's very important yeah for you us. could do that that'd be good so yeah somebody on reddit said that if you didn't like poor quality audio that you shouldn't listen to my podcast it's like that's what? a bit rude <laughs> it was back in like april when she was yeah, admittedly it was a bit ropier back then <laughs> Okay, well, on that, uh, I'm going to leave you to go back to your job and uh, editing later. I, I will go to back to editing. Uh, where can people find you when you wish to be found? And what's your goodbye? You can find me on Twitter. I'm very loud on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at IamFophos, um, which is I-A-M-P-H-O-P-H-O-S. And um, you can find me talking about the San Gennaro Corp um, and other things on Yes Indeed Pod, which is Y-E-S-I-N-D-I-E-D-P-O-D. And yeah, normally I'm just retweeting stuff about my other projects most of the time, but also being cross and grumpy about the state of the world and about the state of indie TTRPGs, but also very hopeful and enthusiastic at the same time. So I'm always on brand. It's always indie. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, get in touch with me about anything, including editing, because I'm always happy to talk about it. And yeah, I don't, I don't think I've got a better sign off than that. So yeah, that's just going to be that. That's decent. You know, that's a decent sign off. So uh, I won't try to to top it. Uh, we just say people. In addition to the subscription and so on, please go check my Patreon. Uh, I'm hoping to have an answer regarding a job application today, but I, I'm unemployed since late January. So any support via Patreon is highly welcome. Uh, uh, but not a, the point where you could support me and my family, but at least it, may, it creates money in which I can invest in the show and uh, in my game design and uh, make uh, my game Paris Gondo the life-saving magic of inventoring happen faster because the first thing I'm going to spend money on is an editor. So if you were convinced about Mark's uh, explanation of what an editor is, uh, please help me hire one. On that, thank you very much, everyone. See you next Monday. It will be at uh, uh, half past 4 p.m. 
in the UK, uh, that means 10, 10, 10, 30 a.m., I believe, in the Pacific time, somewhere around lunchtime, I guess, uh, on the East Coast. So please go check us out as we will be joined by the team of Machine Age. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, all the people in the chat room. We had a, a few today. Uh, that's really encouraging. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Ciao.